great day. It's good to be amongst my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, where we come together to worship God in spirit and in truth. If you're visiting with us, we want you to know that you are our honored guest and that you're not a stranger here, but you are a guest of God. And if you have any questions, uh, we would uh, leave, be gladly uh, uh, happy to you know, entertain as many questions that you have at the conclusion of this morning's worship service. I'm not pretty sure everybody knows what the word manifest means or manifestation. And uh, like it embodies something, you know, uh, what you express. And the thing is, is that I can't tell you how the Spirit manifests within you. If you want to say amen, you can say amen. I'm not going to stop you from saying amen. If you want to clap your hands, I'm not going to stop you from clapping your hands. If that's the way that the Spirit manifests within you. If you want to stand up and shout hallelujah, I'm not going to stop you from doing that. If the Spirit is allowing you and telling you to do that. If you want to raise your hands, I'm not going to stop you from doing that. Because that's how the Spirit is manifesting within you. But we have come together this morning to worship our God in spirit and in truth. And we are so happy that each and every one of you are here. And if you have your Bibles, whether if you have it in paper book, or if you have it electronically, or if you don't even have your Bible, I just want you to hold up your hand and raise it up to the heavens and repeat after me. <coughs> and say that this is the Word of God, this is the, Word of God. the Book of All Ages. Book of all ages. I, will I will know it. I will live it. I will believe it. Amen. What's the point? What's the point? Have you ever heard someone say, what's the point? What's the point of living? What's the point of life? What's the point if we can't have fun? You probably have heard, what's the bloody point? What's the point of anything? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look at Verse 16 and 17. <coughs> Paul said, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Paul wanted the church at Corinth to understand that they are a unified body of believers. He didn't want them to see themselves as a collection of competing interests at all, working against one another. He didn't want them to see themselves as individuals trying to accomplish their goals or what they wanted to do, but he wanted them to see themselves as a team. Working, working together collectively, not to accomplish their goals, not to accomplish their purpose, but to accomplish the purpose of God, God's will. In John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for his followers that they would be unified, that they would be together. Why? So that the world may know who you are. We have one more week left up in our study. Uh, week 30 this week, week 31 next week, and time has gone by very quickly. But I hope that you've learned as much as I have and you've grown in your faith walk with God. I hope that you have grown spiritually and that you will continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ. We move from the Old Testament understanding of the temple as the holy physical structure that was God's house on earth. And now we 
move to the New Testament understanding of the church being the body of Christ. God's holy temple. Now this center that we in, this, this Lakeway Activity Center that we meet in week in and week out, this is not God's dwelling place per se. But the body of believers, the followers throughout the world, is God's dwelling place. Built together spiritually. Bound together by the Holy Spirit in spite of our differences. In spite of our differences. Whatever they may be, some of them may be geographical, cultural, <coughs> race, gender, or age. Some of you uh, have a different political preference than I would have, or vice versa. But we all are members of the house that God built. At times, that house was torn down through division. At times, that house is torn down through disagreement. But in Christ, we are all members of the same household. We are citizens. We're not strangers. We're not aliens. Paul said, whether you like it or not, whether we're comfortable with it or not, we are all different varieties of people. God has made each one of us different. But he's made us one house. One body. God's dwelling place. Now I'm not uh, so sure that the world will always see us that way. I'm not sure that the world will always see us as being one body. And the truth be told, sometimes I don't recognize myself as being God's dwelling place. But guess what? I've been redeemed. And so have you by the blood of the Lamb. I've been grafted. I'm welded in the body of Christ. Just like you are. <coughs> a part of God's household. I remember going to college when I was a freshman. That's normally when you start college when you're a freshman. And I arrived uh, a couple of days early than anybody else. And I didn't know who my roommate was going to be. And when he arrived, I immediately knew that he grew up one way and I grew up a different way. We didn't always get along. We didn't always see eye to eye. But primarily because of the friends that he brought with him. His friends were these cockroaches. I wasn't accustomed to waking up each morning and seeing a cockroach at the end of my bed. No big deal for him, but I was shocked. I had to get out of that situation as quickly as I could to find myself a new roommate. But I ended up having my own room. And when you're in college, it's pretty nice having your own room. I mean, if you know where I'm coming from. Other than that, we got along pretty well. We played basketball together. I mean, as I travel across this country, I go from hotel to hotel, and the first thing I do when I get to my hotel room, besides wipe everything down, I put a do not disturb sign on the outside of my door. I mean, the reason that I do that is because I don't, Want, the, want someone to accidentally come to my room because that happens sometimes. People are confused on which room and they're trying to get in. And then I might not always have my room serviced either every single day. You know, if I stay two or three days, I might. But I don't always have it serviced. But in Christ, it isn't up to me to decide who my roommate is going to be. Amen? I can't choose the folks that I want to be in my house and that I don't want in my house. I can't place a do not disturb sign or keep out sign on this house that God has built. I have to allow people to come in. 
I guess we all wish we could put a do not disturb sign every once in a while on our door, a keep out sign, because to be honest, some people just get on your nerves if you're telling the truth. But it's not my house. It's not your house. It's the house of God. What's the point? What's the point in coming to church? What's the point of the church? What's the church for? These are some questions that people have had for years. But before I can tell you what the church is for, I must tell you what the church is not. The church I read about in the Bible is not a denomination. The church existed several hundred years before any denomination was formed. The church precedes all Catholicism. It precedes all Protestantism. You can be a member of the church without ever being a member of a denomination. The church is not a material house, but it is a spiritual house. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse number 15, if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. Now, the more correct usage of the word here is house instead of household. So if you go to, go to the King James Version, instead of household, you'll see the word house. The believer in God's house, because God dwells in the house. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to follow me here in verse number 5. You also, like living stones are being built in a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual <coughs> sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So God is the living stone. We are the living stones. And the key word here is living. Because the Lord is the living one. He's the life-giving one. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As members of the body of Christ, we as Christians partake of the same nature as our Lord, and we are living stones. And we are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Did you know that we were endowed with a measure of the Spirit which will raise us up in the last day? Some have called this building that we're in today the church. <coughs> That's not the case. This building is not the church. The building we are in today is nothing more than stone, lumber, and mortar. But the church is spiritual in nature, made up of Christians. And each member is a stone in God's house. Men may build a, a church building, but Christ is the building of the church. Amen? Matthew 16, 18, and I tell you that you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome. So if you have your bulletins this morning, I want you to take some notes. So what is the church? What is the church? The church is, first of all, the called out. The Greek word is ekklesia. <coughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2. In verse 14, he called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a choice that either we are going to accept or we are not going to accept. All of you are called, all of us are called, but only those who hear and accept and obey are going to share in the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Acts 26 and verse number 18. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. So that they may receive forgiveness of sins. And place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. When with the forgiveness of sins. All the hardships of life that you may be experiencing and going through. All the misfortunes that you may have, all the disappointments and sufferings, all the sorrows and woes will resolve at last in eternal glory for the redeemed. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 13, he says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his Son. He loves into his marvelous light. That's what he does. Secondly, the church is the saved. The church is the saved. Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes in me and is baptized will be saved. But whoever, did not, whoever does not will be condemned. If you remember, Peter said over in Acts chapter 2, in verse number 38, he said, Peter replied and said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promises for you and your children and for all who are far off and all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And the Bible says about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And guess what they did? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. And the Lord added to their number day those who were being saved. Church salvation is in Christ Jesus. Paul said, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, we were all given the one spirit to drink. And the Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. And Paul said, God placed all things under his feet. And appointed him to be head over everything. The church. Which is the body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. I mean our last point right here. Is the church is the sanctified. It's the sanctified. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 2 says. The church of God in Corinth to those Sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere call on his name. Every Christian is sanctified. They're set apart after they obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now look with me very quickly in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse Number eight. First Corinthians chapter six and starting with verse number eight. Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong and do this to your brothers and sisters. Sometimes in all the bickering, Amongst Christians there at the Corinthian church. Some of them made false statements. 
that caused a division among themselves. Verse number 9. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither, neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. You're not now, but that's what you were. That's past tense. <coughs> but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, by the Spirit of our God. Amen? Shout hallelujah. The church is the church of God, which is which which it actually expresses the relationship of the church to the world. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. The church is the house of God, which expresses the family relationship of the church. The church is God's family, and everyone, every person born again becomes a child of God, a family member. We are members of his family, the church. Do you remember, I'm over in John chapter 3, where, Nic where John was speaking with Nicodemus, and he said, be baptized, that you will be born again, and you will become a family member. The church is the temple of God, which expresses the worship feature of the church. During the time of Moses, the tabernacle was in the wilderness, if you remember, and the temple of Solomon in Jerusalem were dedicated to the worship of God as the dwelling place of God during the Jewish dispensation. Today, God does not dwell in temples made with hands, but where does he dwell? He dwells in the church. The church, the temple, it is not a material house, but it is a spiritual edifice, living stone. The church is the body of Christ, which expresses the fellowship feature of the church. Christ is the head of the church, the church, the temple of God. All Christians are members of that one body. There is an intricate and vital relationship between Christ and Christians, which make up his body, the church. The church is the kingdom of God, which is expresses the governmental feature of the church. It is an absolute monarchy, which Jesus is the sovereign monarch. Amen? No person can, can amend or revise his laws for his church. Only he can do that. Whether we, the church, meet here in this building, which we do week by week, Or if we meet outside in a park, or if we meet over to someone's house, we are the church. So why do we meet? What's the church for? What's the point? What's the point of the church? Let's just talk about that, and this lesson will be yours. What the church is for. Number one, the church is for the work of evangelism. That's what it's for. Matthew chapter 28, starting with verse number 18, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of what? All nations. Doing what? Baptizing them in the name of who? The Father and the who? The Son and the who? The Holy Spirit. And doing what? Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of time. The very end of the age. Disciples can only be made by teaching. They can only be made by teaching. Do you remember the Ethiopian eunuch when he was coming back from Jerusalem? And he was reading the book of Isaiah? And Philip came up to him because he invited him into the chariot. And he said, what are you reading? Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I understand unless somebody teach me? You remember that? Thus, we are to go into all nations. Mark makes this very clear in Mark chapter 16. One of the basic principles of faith is teaching. It's a prerequisite.
prerequisite of discipleship. You don't have to say amen. I know the Bible's right. If we don't go out and teach people, how will they come to know? And after someone comes to the understanding of the truth and they want to be baptized into Christ, we have a responsibility to keep teaching them. And they have a responsibility to keep learning the word of God and growing in Christ. 2 Timothy, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and forever. Amen. 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 If you say you don't have time to teach someone, you're missing the point. Secondly, the church is for the work of edification. Write that down. The church is for the work of edification. Acts chapter 14, starting with verse number 21, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they turned to Lystra, <coughs> Iconium. Did I say that right again? Iconium. And Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Every time we look at the word edification, every time you look at it in the New Testament scriptures, it's talking about the corporate body. That's what it's talking about. Us collectively working together as a team, which involves mutual, mutual, mutual edification. Helping one another to be Christ-like. It can't just be one member. It can't just be two members. It can't just be three members. I'm like, unless that's all you have. But it takes all of us working together when we take the time to lift one another up, when we take the time to hold one another accountable according to the scriptures. It will move us all to be more like Christ. But if it's not according to the scriptures, don't come to me with anything. If it's not according to the scriptures. When we have an attitude of service, this will ensure the needs of the church are being met. And we will have a deeper connection on a spiritual level. Someone once said, without mutual, mutual edification, the church becomes a collection of spiritual weaklings. A perpetual nursery for spiritual infants rather than a body of believers. If you don't have time to edify the body, you're missing the point. And finally, the church is for the work of benevolence. The church is for the work of benevolence. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 10. <coughs> All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. The very thing I had been eager to do all along. When Paul visited Jerusalem, when he visited Jerusalem, for the final time, he delivered contributions to them, to the men that were there, James and the elders. Then over in Acts chapter 21 and verse number 17, we see when he arrived in Jerusalem, the brothers accepted their contribution gladly, the Bible says, with great joy. And Paul had prayed about this. He prayed about the money being raised for them and that they would receive it gladly. And guess what we're going to be doing next week? And if you haven't already, grab one of those orange sheets of paper. <coughs> Feed the need. We're going to be doing that. And if you can't go shopping for yourself, let someone know. We'll go shopping for you. I and mean, if you don't want to do that, write a $35 check. We're going to pray about it. We're going to pray about it together that these people will receive this gift. Glad. If you say that you don't have time to feed the sick, if you, don't, if you say that you don't have time to help the helpless, if you say that you don't have time to go sit and pray with someone who needs spiritual healing, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. We have been charged to go 
go out and spread the good news to all those that we come in contact with. And to accomplish this mission, the church, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, is all sufficient. And it's the only missionary organization needed to evangelize the world. That's my opinion. It's just George saying that. But you know what? We don't need Oprah Winfrey. We don't need Dr. Phil. We don't need Dr. Oz. You know what? God needs you. He wants you. That's who he wants. Now, I'm going to, uh, I'm taking my time here this morning. I mean, that's okay. I, I don't want to rush this process. But I just want to show you this. And I want this is my drawing. <laughs> kind of like a gingerbread man or something like that. <laughs> and uh, Patrick, I mean, if you don't mind stopping the recording right now, but those who are listening at home, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, how do you do that? Is that you call upon his name and you can accept him. And you can go down into the water and raise the baptism and rise and you can preach in Christ. But if you can stop that right now, 